Welcome everyone to the Wild Ones first meeting of the year 2022. I want to welcome and glad to see names and faces of members and some friends that are also interested in our program tonight. Um, just a quick, uh, quick description to those who are new or have not tuned into any Wild Ones programs. Uh, I'm Lisa Otis. I'm the chapter president for the Men Menominee River area chapter of Wild Ones. Wild Ones is a national nonprofit organization that focuses on biodiversity, uh, native habitat restoration, preservation. Um, if you'd like to know more, it's wildones.org, very simple. It's nationwide and there are right now 55 chapters with a dozen seedling chapters that, which those are new chapters that are forming. So we've really, are, steam, are going full steam ahead and uh, getting people excited about native plants. So um, we are some chapter business. We are going to do Zoom meetings for obviously January, February, March, and April. Potentially April, we could do live. It depends on, of course, where COVID is at the time. Um, our, we hope to have our May to September meetings outdoors, and we've got some fun surprises for uh, some of the outdoor programs. Uh, our usual programs are third Wednesday of each month, but we've got a couple of Saturday programs that I think will be a, a lot of fun and give us a little more time, a little more daylight to do some different things. All right, so um, just kind of what's happening. We do have a couple of events, our plant sale the month of June, 40% off to members of Wild Ones uh, is planned to take place. Um, I know we are doing a uh, display and, and John Michael, our vice president could tell you more about it. Uh, gonna give away some uh, milkweed plants that he's growing some seedlings and display Wild Ones there. Um, so that should be fun, that'll be in May. Uh, I think a lot of people are, uh, you know, waiting to see what happens as we go along. So hopefully we'll be adding more events to our, to 2022, where we have the opportunity to spread the word about wild ones and about planting native plants. All right. Um, one thing I did want to mention in November, we managed to uh, have our members only seed and treat exchange. We did it outdoors. Thank you, Duane and Laura, almost combine them, Luane, that's pretty good for both of them. Um, they held it in their garage. John Michael did a lot of organizing with members to collect seeds, to package things and make it a safe event. So we definitely are planning on November again to have that. Hopefully it's indoors, but if not, we'll still, we'll still do it because it was really fun that day. All right, um, our webpage, our schedule is posted there. So it's Menominee River area wildones.com. There's our, our landing page. As you can see, our schedule is posted um, and we'll be adding some more information and con confirmed programs once we have it. We also have a link to our rather robust YouTube channel, which houses programs that we've recorded in 2020 and 2021. And I got to say, when it's cold and snowy and, and just uh, not great gardening, outdoor gardening weather. Some of those programs are very appealing with uh, that are shot in spring and summer. So check it out. Yeah, we have a bunch of them. And we decided to start doing them in smaller pieces, like 15 minutes, so that you're not committed to uh, watching one of the pr programs for an hour. Um, so yeah, check it out. Check it out. It, it's, it's good stuff there. Um, as I said, our regular programs will be the third Wednesday of each month with some Saturday programs, special programs. Um, our next program in February is Native Orchid Restoration with Melissa Curran. She's an environmentalist and botanist at Stantec Consulting Services. And I do wanna say thank you to Carolyn Larkin, one of our board members who has worked hard to arrange these early in the year programs. Thank you, Carolyn, appreciate it. All right, um, we are also working on our annual newsletter. Um, we've got some different ideas for the newsletter as well as for monthly chapter uh, emails. So keep, stay tuned. Uh, we'll have more things on uh, rolling out with that. Um, 
during everything, during the last couple of months, even last year, our board has been meeting and trying to adapt to what appears to be our new normal world, at least for now. Um, so we've had a lot of things going on as far as, you know, getting programs going, um, the structure of our board, uh, board members and, and our chapter. Um, and I want to say that we did have a board meeting last week and we've had a couple of non-board members attend the meetings. And that has been so fantastic. Um, we've got, I, I know I gained perspective and also there were some great ideas shared. Uh, so I just want to let everybody know that any member is welcome to sit in our board meeting, submit ideas or thoughts, um, you know, that really helps to keep things fresh and uh, moving forward. So we are planning, hopefully, to do the, um, uh, let's see, the second Thursday of each month. So the next board meeting would be February 10th at 6.30. So if you're interested, let me know. You can email me or you can email through our chapter website. And uh, um, yeah, just ideas you want to attend, you know, everyone's welcome. And if we get a lot of people, we might have to rent a place or something. So, uh, so let me know uh, so we can make plans ahead of time. Um, so speaking of board business, uh, we do have two uh, positions, officer positions that will be opening up. Uh, we, we are in need of a treasurer and a secretary. Um, I wanna thank Barb Walter who has been our secretary for like 25 years. It's, it's amazing. She's been taking notes and has been in on a lot of things over those years. And uh, she has decided that she just wants to step down from that for now. And uh, so we need someone to fill that position. Also our treasurer, Norm uh, Greer has been fantastic. I mean, thank you, Norm. I don't know if you're on, but um, he jumped in when our last treasurer, our dear Amy, um, passed away suddenly. And he's done a great job in picking things up and keeping things going. And we have a, a, a we're, our checkbook is healthy and, thing, and he's taking care of everything. So thank you, Norm, for that. So I'd like members, you know, if anyone's interested in um, these positions or just, uh, you know, volunteering, um, I'll, be, I'll send an email out with a little more details on the positions. And um, hopefully, you know, we can find a couple of people that are interested in, in lending a hand and you know, keeping these vital pieces of a chapter together and, and moving. All right. Well, I think that is all that I have to say. Just want to say thanks to everybody. Oh, no, I'm sorry. There was one thing that I did want to talk about, and that's uh, national webinars. There's a new one that was just posted today. Uh, Neil Dubow from Prairie Nursery is going to give a talk on, uh, what is it? Uh, genetic diversity and plant preservation. So it's another free webinar sponsored by Wild Ones, the national organization, national headquarters. It's February 16th at 6 p.m. You go to the website and you can sign up for the free webinar. They also have many of their webinars. I think all of them are posted for uh, viewing for free. General public members, doesn't matter. They've been doing a great job of just trying to get the word out getting people interested in planting native plants. And I think they're doing an amazing job at that. So I think that's the last thing that I have. So um, I'm going to introduce our speaker tonight, um, Dan Carter. Dan is going to talk to, or Dan is a landowner services coordinator for the Prairie Enthusiasts, which is a nonprofit organization as well and helps landowners identify opportunities to restore prairies and other fire dependent ecosystems and plan for those efforts. He's made 140 private landover, landowner visits to properties in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Illinois in this capacity since 2020. Previously, he was responsible for natural area assessment and planning for the South, South, Southeastern Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission and I'm sorry, Dan, I had put SUIS rather than sewer pack in my email to the chapter. It's um, confusing. <laughs> well, those acronyms, you know, <laughs> we need dictionaries with just the acronyms. Um, all right, so uh, let's see where we're, and 
Oh, so you were responsible for natural area assessment planning for the Southeastern Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission and held a recent a research fellowship with the Milwaukee Public Museum studying remnant oak woodlands and savannas in Southeastern Wisconsin. Dan earned his doctorate in biology from Kansas City University with research focused on the reconstruction of tall grass prairies, prairie plant communities in Iowa, Nebraska, and Oklahoma. Dan's been active in prairie restoration and reconstruction since the mid 1990s, as well as being a gardener using native plants since that time and applying what he learns from natural communities. All right. Well, Dan, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And a couple of housekeeping things. We're going to mute microphones. If you have a question, you can go into the chat box. So if you hover your mouse down at the bottom of the screen, you can type in questions. And we'll also have some time for Q&A uh, at the end of the talk. So Dan, take it away. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you. Um, so my sharing is working. I assume it looks like it's working. That's always, it always feels like high stakes. Um, I'm coming to you from the kids' playroom because the family's out of the house and I don't know if they'll get home while I'm still talking and the dog will go crazy when that happens. And you might still hear that, I'm not sure. But if you hear a dog barking, it's not, um, <laughs> it's not anything other than that. Um, so, you know, this is our front yard um, and, you know, that's our house out in Dousman, Wisconsin. Um, and we, we moved in and I pretty much just got that underway. Um, and sort of my thinking around gardening with native plants has continued to change over the last several years. And um, this presentation in particular has sort of, um, it, it, it originally was more geared towards um, alternative lawns like mowed grass with native plants um, and, and doing that in a native way. Um, but I've, I've expanded it to encompass more the, the broad range of how you might use your property. So there are areas that you use less and um, might landscape with differently. Um, a little bit about myself. I like gardening. I've always, I mean, I've gardened since I was a kid. I think my first garden was a moss garden under the deck when I was five. I don't know. Um, uh, I started gardening with native plants in high school. I grow vegetables too. Um, when we lived in Kansas, I could really grow some sweet potatoes. So this is, I don't know, 100, 150 pounds of sweet potatoes in that row. Um, uh, and you know, I still, I still have a vegetable garden in addition to a native plant garden. And you'll see some hints of that. Um, I work for the Prairie Enthusiasts, um, which, has some overlap and, and commonality with wild ones. The focus of the prairie enthusiasts um, is fire dependent ecosystems in particular. So it's prairies, but also savannas and oak woodlands and everything associated with those sedge meadows, um, generally in, in the upper Midwest. And my job with them is to visit people, private landowners, um, this is an example of one of those properties and walk around with them and talk about what the opportunities are and what they have, you know, do they actually have opportunities to restore remnant oak woodlands and prairies and those sorts of things. And this was a landowner that did. Um, oftentimes they have cool stuff. Um, this is a new occurrence of a state rare sedge that's 100 miles outside of its known range. Um, and that happens surprisingly often when you visit people on, on their private properties and, and walk around and take the time to look. Um, so I have an exciting job that I li like a lot because I, I, I fart around outside, see neat things, um, get to tell people what I think about things and what they can do. Um, I'm gonna start transitioning here. So I'm talking about lawn alternatives and alternative lawns and native lawns. And so I'll give you a little bit of, uh, I'll, I'll try to parse out um, the semantics here. So um, when I'm talking about lawn alternatives, really that's anything that's not your stupid mode turf grass, right? You know, so anything other than exotic cool season turf grass, and that includes our native gardens and native, alternative lawns. So 
Um, here's an example of a conventional lawn. And this is one, people like to show pictures of really big, expansive, preposterous lawns. Well, they can be equally preposterous when they're tiny like this. This is in Delafield where Highway 83 comes up to Interstate 94. And I drive by this all the time now because the kids are getting just about weekly COVID tests at Summit Labs. But, um, but this is another um, conventional lawn. I've seen, I've seen the crews hop out with their string trimmers and, and rake the mulch and trim these down periodically. Um, but these are resource intensive and they're not diverse. And this is an alternative lawn and everything you see mowed there um, is something that's native to Eastern North America. There's no bluegrass, no fescue, none of that stuff. And so there's a lawn that we have at our house that I mow and it's where the kids play and the dog plays. Um, and then there's the broader context of our whole landscape. Um, just a little more by way of background, and I, we're aware of this generally, I think, that there's just an incredible amount of turf grass out there. The square mileage of it is greater than that of the national parks in the lower 48. And when we think about things like tall grass prairie, you know, we only have several thousand of the original 230,000 square miles of tall grass prairie. And most of that several thousand acres that remains is severely degraded prairie in the Flint Hills of Kansas and parts of Nebraska and Northeast Oklahoma. Um, it's not even incredibly healthy prairie. So um, the natural communities and their component species are um, uh, in need of help. Um, so the way I come at this is that it's the least that we can do, um, what we can do on the property we own. Um, if it's a residential lot, it's a residential lot. Um, but I think it's important to remember that protecting and stewarding the remaining, and I'll call them old growth natural communities, it can be a forest, but it can be a prairie, um, is critical uh, because we are still losing remnant old growth prairies um, and the associated communities, we're losing them to development. So something that um, is around, well, it's, it's been covered some in media and um, I see it a lot in social media, but there's a prairie associated with the Rockford Airport in Northern Illinois. It's a high quality dry gravel prairie and an access road is slated to be built through it soon. Um, and there was an agreement to save this prairie back in the 70s, but you know the present iteration of airport leadership has decided to, to stop that. Um, and so there's sort of a campaign to protect that prairie. So we're still losing prairies to development. There was a music prairie lost to I-94 work um, in, in Racine County in recent years. Um, we're losing more prairie to lack of adequate stewardship than we are to development though, maybe an order of magnitude more. So in Southeastern Wisconsin, we've lost a lot more prairie to succession to thicket and forest um, than development in the last 30 years. And that's because prairies need, need stewardship. They need fire, um, they need brush work, especially if they're not getting fire. Um, and there are individual elements of them that are replaceable, but the communities themselves are irreplaceable. There are species in them that are difficult to grow elsewhere, recover elsewhere. It's not just the plants, but it's associated soil microbial communities and fungi and insects that are specialists on the plants. Um, so they're irreplaceable and sort of philosophically, and I'll, I feel this way about plants too, is that they have intrinsic value. I don't feel like they necessarily have the obligation to be doing anything for us, um, but they are also life rafts of the species and genetic diversity that we have available to us for the future. And we are just losing it all the time. And at some point we need to stop because when it's gone, we're not going to get it back. And so it's not just about species, extinction, it's about losing populations and the genetics of those populations. Um, so it's important to do what we can at home where we live, but um, it's important, I think, also to look outward and advocate for the protection of what we have left. And just a couple of pictures. So um, this is the Black Earth Redmond Prairie 
in, in Dane County, our reconstructed prairies don't look like this. And even if we put tons of effort into a small space where we live, it's difficult to recreate something like this. Um, this is a very, uh, just the interactions going on here, the co-evolved interactions among these species are just so complex. And this is something that developed over hundreds of thousands of years, <laughs> um, you know, so um, to think that this is something that's replaceable on shorter time scales, I think is overly optimistic. And, you know, some of our prairie reconstructions do better with the later flowering species, but this is another remnant music prairie. This one's in, in Western Iowa and the picture is strategically taken, but, you know, this is surrounded by a sea of, of corn. This is just four acres in the middle of hundreds of acres of just corn. Um, but, you know, so back to our conventional lawns, um, they don't support a lot of plant species. We usually in a conventional lawn, conventional lawn strive for that to be the case. Um, and particularly those that support specialist insects. So I'll talk a little bit about having native, truly native species in a lawn and how those can maybe support specialist insects. Um, I'll just sort of, as an aside say, um, a weedy lawn is still better than just nothing but grass. Um, you can support generalist pollinators with, you know, clover and creeping Charlie and stuff like that in the lawn. But you can actually support specialist insects too. We can have native plants instead of those quote unquote weeds. Um, and so here I have a couple of pictures. Um, on the right is actually in my lawn, um, the place where we're active. And that's an American lady butterfly in very early April coming back and laying eggs on um, pussy toes or field cat's foot, which is all over in our lawn um, and supports that butterfly. Um, and not in the lawn, but that's, um, that's a giant swallowtail caterpillar on um, hop tree, Telia, which is a native shrub. Um, so I, I feel this way about natural communities, but I also feel like plants have intrinsic value. And, um, and even if we want to try to um, put a value on them, we still have an incomplete understanding of what their roles are in ecosystems and what their relationships are with other species. And um, our most well-preserved and intact natural communities are incredibly complex and have many parts. Um, Growing native plants um, in our gardens uh, is an opportunity, and maybe this will dovetail with, with Neil DeBolt's seminar, but just as a thought, but it's an opportunity for us to preserve and amplify genetic diversity of these species. And we don't do a very good job of that. Um, and you know, the way we garden and interact with a horticultural industry doesn't do a very good job of that because you know we're buying from um, producers of, of plant material who may or may not be sourcing material widely or um, paying a lot of attention to the genetics of that material and having genetically diverse material. Um, but we can do that and sort of native gardening in some cases does do that. So there are cases where people are growing native plants in their home landscapes as as seed orchards that facilitate and support um, restoration efforts in, for natural communities like oak savannas and prairies and that sort of thing. Um, so that's an opportunity that's there. And it's something we need to do more of because a lot of these things are difficult to um, come by commercially. Um, and a lot of their production is not really um, commercially feasible. Um, and so when we think about the restoration needs that we have in any given area, um, just sourcing that seed is a real problem. And we need to sort of develop systems to do that. And one of the grassroots ways to do it is for volunteers to do it in seed orchards. Um, on the left, that's just a slender bush clover, um, just as an example of a, of a um, of an individual plant. And just this is just tangential and um, sort of on the side, just in the course of my visits to people, I was, I was tying my shoe and this hit me in the face and it's a state threatened species. And it wasn't even what I was there visiting the person about. 
um, there's still so much opportunity out there. Um, <laughs> conventional lawns are boring. Um, I, I think, I don't know, we're complex creatures. Uh, I think we can, we can strive for more. And they separate us for nature. And the way we garden between lawns and beds and borders separates us from nature. So the picture on the right, that's where my in-laws used to live. Um, the lawn outside their condo with an HOA and you see the plastic border and the plants mulched with gravel in the lawn. And it's pretty clear in that sort of setting. Well, it's, it's, it's actually kind of clear that really you're not supposed to be on that lawn, but certainly not in among those plants and interacting with those plants. And I see that as a problem. Um, I, I see that as something we need to get away from. So, you know, we have a couple of small kids and people think, well, we have to have a big lawn for the kids to play in. And that's ridiculous. Um, let the kids go out and play in your yard and let that yard be nature. Um, and they can have wonderful experiences there and learn a lot. And so that's something that my kids do. Um, <laughs> you know, Prairie Drop Seed makes a good bean bag. Um, we have, and we interact with wildlife because it's right there, right? Um, just more examples of things we see, the potter wasp nest that's on the blazing star. That's a, a bumblebee mimic um, uh, ro um, robber fly that has a Japanese bill, uh, beetle um, that's captured a Japanese beetle. And it, it fell out of a tree in our front yard on my wife's shirt. And I was like, oh, be still, there's bumblebee. But it was a robber fly, which is, which is really cool. Um, on the left there, those are um, finid wasps. Uh, they're um, parasitoids on the grubs of um, scarab beetles. So things like Japanese beetles that maybe we want less of and, and June beetles, those sorts of things. And that's actually an aggregation of males. So they don't have true stingers or anything. And um, they're on a Great Plains oval sedge. But, you know, I took uh, my son Carl down to that and we looked at all the wasps that had gathered there. They form these aggregations in cool weather in the evening and in the morning. Um, and, you know, there's a box elder tree that I, I killed and felled and it's there and there's a dryad saddle um, uh, coming out of the side of it that the kids are looking at in the, gym, in the garden. And man, the tree frogs are everywhere. Um, be careful. I have to be careful when I garden. I came in once and I had one stuck to the seat of my pants. Uh, but they're everywhere and we see them everywhere. And it's amazing how many there are when we stop to look around in the garden. They seem to especially, one of them's on prairie coreopsis, but they seem to especially like to just sit in the middle of big broad leaves during the day. So like the common milkweed there. Um, there's a nice spider on, on the woolly buds of some service berry in early April. And there's a, a solitary bee excavating its nest. Also very early April, just out in the middle of the garden. Um, bare soil can be a good thing for those bees. Um, it's good to have some of that. Um, okay, so how do we make our, our yards into prairies, savannas, and woodlands so we can interact with them more at home. Um, you see back, so I alluded, I still grow vegetables. There's vegetables back there. Um, and this is sort of a process or my process. And, you know, I'm not, I have no background in landscape design, um, no formal background in horticulture. I originally wanted to go to, to undergrad for horticulture, but I decided not to. Um, but this is, this is my take. Um, but you need to know how you use your space, you know, um, and that takes a little bit of evaluation. So identify the areas that you spend a lot of time in, where there's a lot of foot traffic, where you might play yard games, where the dog might be out, um, that sort of things. Um, then there are areas that if you try to become conscious of the time you spend in your yard, that, that you walk through them, but not a, not a lot, maybe a few times a week. And maybe you're just walking around the house, but you're not really spending time there. And then there are areas that if you've got all turf grass that are unused, you only are there when you're mowing them. And those are the areas that are most ridiculous to maintain as lawn because really 
if you're only there when you're mowing it, um, that says something. Um, and so this is just sort of how that worked out on, on our lot, um, just generally. So those most heavily used areas are the areas that I reserved for having a lawn. And because I'm a native plant person, um, my sort of pet project is having an alternative lawn that is that consists solely of North American plants and you can do it. Um, it's some work. So that's, that's a view of it. There's um, a native grass in the front called poverty oak grass. There's some kittentails in it, which is a, a threatened plant and some native sedges. And in the back, that's buffalo grass, which isn't native to Wisconsin, but it's native um, just to our South and West. Um, and sort of the, the practice of mowing a lawn mimics where it gr would grow or where it did grow historically, which was on the bison grazing lawns. Um, then these lightly to moderately used areas, you plant those with lower, oh, and I, I added this, I forgot to say it. So in your lawn, that's all low vegetation. And very early, that's referring to things that bloom are gonna be things that bloom early. There's sort of a sequence in our native vegetation and the things that bloom early tend to be low growing. And as you move through the season, things bloom at increasingly, you know, taller heights. So in your lawn, things bloom early and low and lightly, moderately used areas, you'll use vegetation that's still low, but maybe not quite so low, still blooms generally early, but maybe not as early or more mixed. And in these areas, um, at least at, at my place, I might mow these once or twice to help maintain them as lower vegetation. These are areas we walk through occasionally, and sometimes we sort of expand the lawn to include these or not, depending on how we're using um, our property. And then those unused areas can be planted to taller vegetation, and that generally blooms later. And a caveat, caveat to that is those areas can also support low growing stuff that blooms early. That area can support the full sequence early to late um, through time. So that's what this kind of looks like um, across the backyard. So on the left, the red dot is on the lawn. The yellow dot is sort of transitional with sort of that intermediate, you know, moderate use space. And that goes up around the, the side of the house there. And then the areas we use less have taller vegetation in them. And then just another view of that, what this, what the lawn looks like before I've mowed it even once. So in, in May, you know, you see all this little seed heads on the buffalo grass there. There's the dog. There's a bunch of ragwort blooming out, out there. Um, another pre-mo view. This might be a little earlier, a bunch of robins plantain. I have Midland shooting star in the lawn in the right-hand picture from seed. Um, a lot of stuff can grow there. If it has low, if the leaves form a rosette and they're near the ground, it might bloom taller, but when it's done, it can be mowed and the leaves are still there. Midland shooting stars go dormant. They're ephemeral, but not everything else is. The robin's plantain just has low foliage, and so it'll tolerate the foot traffic and the mowing. So that was how you use the space. You know, obviously you need to also understand just some of the general characteristics where you are, the soil characteristics. You know, do you have a clay soil or a sandy soil? Um, what's your soil pH? Um, do you have good drainage? Where's the water table? That sort of thing, because that um, has pretty dramatic effects on what you can grow well, um, particularly whether or not you have sandy or clay soil. You have more options if you have sandy soil. Um, um, and so drainage is related to that, but so are slopes, aspects, that sort of thing. Um, it's important to think about when the ground's frozen in the winter and it rains now in December, sometimes when the ground's frozen and water pools and will water pool, even though I have sandy well-drained soil in this low spot, and that might affect what you can grow. Um, Potential weed issues um, affect how easy it is to convert a space. So if you have an area that's just bluegrass, that's one thing. But if there's a ton of quack grass in there that is difficult to kill, um, it's important to appreciate that beforehand um, before you bite off more than you can chew. Um, 
you know, obviously light conditions. And you can modify those if it's too shady. Um, this is our lot, just Google Street View before, this was taken shortly before we moved in and did anything. There, there's a birch tree and a couple silver maple trees in the front yard. Everybody planted silver maple trees when they built our subdivision back in the 70s. And I cut all the silver maple trees down. I kept the paper birch tree. We have some oak trees too. And I planted a bunch of other new trees that are not silver maples. Um, you can learn a lot from the potential um, of, of what you would do at home from just understanding um, how things um, come together in, in remnant natural communities. And there are fewer and fewer opportunities to do that, but this is an example. This is a Southeast Wisconsin um, remnant oak woodland. Um, probably at the time I took this photo, the last best remnant of oak woodland, true oak woodland in the state, that meaning it's not so dark and closed as forest. The oak trees are closer together than they are in a savanna. Um, and so, you know, what species are there? What species grow with one another? What species are in the shadier patches and in the sunnier patches? Um, you notice, I mean, that's park-like and welcoming, and that's an unmanicured space. Um, and so, so you can mimic that. Um, also, you know, and a, a point I'd like to make is that the species value in a system like this is not as simple as the number of, of species that it directly supports when, like if you think about consumers. Um, so for example, here, you know, if you look down at the ground, that's all yellow star grass and, and, and wood betony and blue eyed grass and robin's plantain and the grassy stuff is savanna running sedge and, and uh, common wood rush. Um, there's some, some low hedge bindweed, there's sky blue aster in there. You can, it's fun to look at pictures like this for me and try to find everything. But um, uh, the, really one of the most important things here is the wood betony which is partially parasitic. And because it's partially parasitic, it tends to support or um, cause the community in which it occurs to have a, a lower vegetation height. It tends to suppress tall, aggressive native things. And that allows a lot of low stature things to coexist with them. Um, and it also creates a low vegetation that is more amenable to acorn caching and doesn't support as large of populations of voles that might eat acorns and other rodents that might eat acorns. And it's um, oak, white oaks and red oaks regenerate really well in low healthy herbaceous vegetation like this. And so when we talk about oak woodlands, the oak trees are really important structural elements and they support a ton of biodiversity, a ton of consumers, but their perpetuation in that community uh, is dependent on the health of the herbaceous, the ground layer plant community. And there are species that have different roles in, in, in maintaining that. And some of them have outsized roles like the wood bed. Um, and I'm going back to this picture because this is a sad case. So, this was acquired to build a boat launch. So the tree in the front left, you'll see it goes away. And then we have, um, you know, graded ground up to the trees that were in the background. We're gonna lose those. And we lost a big chunk. Where I took that picture of the ground with all that stuff is under that, well, it got graded and it's under that asphalt. And that was just, that was tragic. This was a tragic thing that happened. It was, um, there were rare species impacts and the you know, the state did this and the incidental take was done post hoc and oh my gosh. Um, I, I got mad about this and I almost, I almost got in trouble, but, um, and, 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 and tried to um, get people um, involved with this, but it, it didn't really go anywhere and this happened. Um, so palate cleanse. Okay, so we still have this prairie though. Um, but just an, another example of this, again, this is in a prairie, not a woodland, but wood betony. Um, there are other native species that, are, that do similar things like bastard toad flax, but um, they really promote coexistence among species. Just another shot of that same prairie. Again, we don't reconstruct prairies like this. this these are the old growth prairies. 
there's oak regeneration. And, you know, this is a degraded herbaceous vegetation, but still low and sedge dominated. And these are white oaks just coming up like crazy under a white oak canopy. Um, and we see less and less of this, but this is because the ground layers are becoming degraded and our woodlands are becoming shadier. Okay. So, <laughs> um, we try to find examples of remnant natural communities to learn from and, and, and plan based on our conditions at home. Um, there are different approaches to doing actual conversions um, and preparation is very important for that. So um, I've taken different approaches. Um, this is where I lived when, we were, when I was in graduate school in Kansas and I'm converting this area to buffalo grass alternative lawn. And I am scraping up the sod with a shovel and I'm taking divisions and I'm planting them out, but I am physically removing everything I don't want. The bluegrass, there's a, it was a big mess. Um, uh, what's the Indian strawberry, Duquesnia, there are different weeds there. Um, there's a weedy onion and stuff. I, I dug all of that out, um, took a while. I do five by five areas at a time. Um, <laughs> I lost my wedding ring doing it. Um, uh, you can smother things. You can smother a conventional lawn. I've done that too. That works best on level areas. And you can kill it all with herbicide. And I, I do that too. And that is a preferred method, particularly where there are slopes. And the reason for that is if you if you kill it just with something like glyphosate, which some people don't like, um, the grass dies, but it's still there and its root systems are still there. And if the ground is sloped, it holds it in place. Um, and that's important. If you, if you smother things with cardboard, water tends to run down between, or other opaque things to um, block sun, water tends to run down in the seams. You tend to have areas where um, if you get heavy rain events, water flows off and, and creates problems. Um, and if you dig and create bare soil, if you, you get a sod cutter and remove sod and create bare soil, that can, that can create problems too. But the, the dead grass does a job for a while. Um, and so here's dead grass doing a job, <laughs> holding soil in place. And I planted a whole bunch of, of native plants in it transplants and divisions, that sort of thing. Um, and that's well prepared, there are no weeds. I made sure it was dead. And actually you can't really tell, um, and I live in a township, I can do lots of things that maybe not everybody can, but uh, the grass died, um, some little annual weeds started growing and I burned it off and killed all those with fire instead of spraying again, and then planted these and the, the sort of singed ends have washed off in the rain. You can't really tell that I did that here. Um, but this is a year later. Um, and so this is just sort of early stages of getting the front yard to be something like a prairie. Um, and this is two years later. And you know the angle changes a little bit, but this is three years. Um, a little further up the hill. Um, similar time, sometimes the spider wart's blooming or not, sometimes it blooms earlier than other years. Um, what it looks like in the fall, which is glorious, um, you know, several years later. So, but there are different ways to get here. Um, but on level ground, you know, you can pick your poison. You can spray or you can use something to, to smother or you can you can sod cut or use a shovel. You have to find places to put that stuff if you dig it up too, which can be an issue. Um, transplants versus seeds. Um, I do it both ways. Um, a large area in the back, and I showed a picture of this with the kids and the dog sitting out there earlier, I did by seed and that's at the left. And in order to do that, I prepared a seed bed and this was when our, around the time our son was born or had just been born and I was taking some paternity leave. So I was home to, I seeded in buffalo grass. I was home to water um, three times a day and keep it moist till it started growing, which took a long time. Um, and all those weeds, all what you can see there is pretty much weeds. And I did weed those very carefully. Um, 
And some of that depended on my ability to be able to tell, you know, the foxtail grass seedlings from the buffalo grass seedlings. And I'm pretty good field botanist can do that, but um, it can be difficult um, with seedlings uh, depending on what your weeds are. Um, and that took really well. And so the picture on the right in the background, that's the area that I seeded. But once I had that area, I started doing transplants. So in the foreground, I've killed the grass with herbicide and I've moved transplants out into it. So some of the pros and cons as I see them, you know, if you do transplants, you have easier weeding because you, you can see the plants that you've planted, you know they're the plants you've planted and you can weed around them until they get large and their canopies cover the soil. Things will fill in and they'll eventually become sort of a living mulch, but um, you can see to weed around them, you don't, it doesn't require as much sort of botanical discernment. Um, there's less preparation. You don't have to prepare a seed bed necessarily. You can just kill a sod and then dig holes and plant things in those holes. Uh, the transplants establish quickly. It can be done any time of year if you keep things watered um, from the time that the ground thaws till the time it freezes in winter. And even in the middle of the summer, if you're smart about doing it when uh, you know, you transplant things in the evening, especially if it maybe will be cloudy the next day or there's rain in the forecast the next day and you do transplants and you water them in. Um, you move things, you don't like shake all the soil off the roots of things, make sure there's soil around the roots. And one of the things I do with transplants, especially during the growing season, I, is I always cut them short. I always clip them down so they're not losing lots of water through their stems and leaves. And things, I mean, I do it in the middle of July. I just keep doing it. Um, and, and, you know, I just systematically worked through our lot doing it, did it through the summer. Uh, less danger of erosion because you're not creating a seed bed. You don't have to do any sort of cultivating and loosening of the soil. You can just leave the dead sod in place and then plant into it. There are a lot of things that you might want if you're going to garden this way that they're, they're just best propagated that way. So Pennsylvania sedge in, in shade or part shade is a species that's really important if you're going to garden this way and it's difficult to establish it by seed um, and probably very inefficient but it's very easy to um, propagate it by division and if you start with a couple clumps of it you can divide each one into maybe 12 plants once or twice a year and and then you know that increases exponential very fast and so i didn't start with a lot of pennsylvania sedge but i have thousands of square feet of it now um, it's more expensive initially when you buy the plants, if you buy the plants. I also start plants in trays. Um, you know, I order seed and I start plants inside and do that sort of thing too. Those aren't as vigorous as just transplants or more established plants though. Um, what this sort of looks like spatially is, um, I usually there are native grasses or sedges and, and I'll, I'll show examples of some of the ones that work well and I space them 12 to 18 inches apart. Um, they're going to form sort of a matrix or living mulch, and they'll compete with the flowers. They'll keep things from getting too tall and flopping over. They'll cover the ground. They'll have lots of shallow roots between the clumps, and so they they will suppress weeds. I use, I, I do it closer to 12 inches than 18, but you can you can space things a little wider. Just it's longer to fill in and and more weeding during that time. And then I intersperse them with wildflowers. Um, so the colored dots there just represent different wildflowers, maybe things that bloom at different times. Um, not just grasses and sedges, there are some native wildflowers that um, can fill a similar role of, you know, those are the things you space 12 to 18 inches apart and then they fill space. And so those wildflowers you put in between, again, thinking about natural communities and how that space is filled. So this is a, a quadrant from my graduate work, but it kind of shows this is there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. There are two different kinds of sedges in there. There's wood betony in there. There's yellow star grass, it's not blooming. And, and, and there's blue eyed grass, it's not blooming in this picture. But there's early stuff and there's mid season stuff like the, the prairie blazing stars right in the middle. Um, and then there are later flowering things like sky blue aster and stiff goldenrod, I mean, a stiff sunflower. Um, uh, there's prairie coreopsis in there too. Again, I'm looking and starting to look at all the plants again that have this big on my screen. Um, so these all fit in that small space. So you can think about that. You're filling space and you try to get things that complement each other in time and maybe in space and in rooting depth. You can also um, start things 
by seed. It's just so some of the pros and cons there. There are more species that avail are available um, from seed. There's less labor initially in terms of planting. It depends on how you, you uh, prepare a seed bed, really. Um, the cost of seed is generally less than transplants, generally, not always. Um, but for some things, you do need additional seed bed preparation. An exception is the wood betony. So I, somebody gave me a bunch of fresh wood betony seed and I spread it out in my Pennsylvania sedge that was established, and established really well. Um, and so there was no seed bed preparation there. It sort of depends on um, different species ecologies. Um, if you do a, prepare a seed bed, there's the erosion risk that I mentioned. Um, weeding is more difficult because you have all these seedlings, you have to, and then there'll be weeds that come up too. If you've prepared a seed bed, that'll stimulate, you know, annual and biannual weeds that are in the seed bank and, and you'll have to deal with all of those. Um, and timing for seeding matters a lot. Um, some things need to be seeded in the fall and have a cool moist period. Some things are better seeded in the spring. The wood betony is best seeded fresh. So the seeds ripen and I spread the seed in early July after I received the fresh ripe, ripened seed from, from a friend. Um, and some of the sources I like for both plants and seeds, um, uh, and these are all Midwest regional, they're not all Wisconsin, but you know, we have prairie nursery and agricole um, are a couple of places in Wisconsin that have really broad selections. Blazing Star Gardens, which is in um, southern Minnesota, has a good selection of prairie plants, including some hard to get things like wood betony and hoary pacoon and, and wood lilies. Isle Native Plants um, makes wholesale vendors selections available to people through retail mail order. And so um, there are, there's a Wisconsin um, nursery, I think it's Taylor Creek Restoration Nursery is available. Uh, through ISIL sometimes, and there's another nursery in Northern Illinois that has a selection that's available through there. And sometimes those are good um, selections and you can get, you know, flats with lots of things, lots of plants in them at a reasonable price if you're going to be doing a lot of transplants. And there's Prairie Moon Nursery, Morning Sky Greenery is another nursery in, in Minnesota. Possibility Place Nursery is in the Chicago area, um, and they sell prairie and woodland herbaceous plants, they sell very high quality woody plants, mail order at a small size that establish very well and very quickly. And I would, I would recommend them for, for that. I've ordered oak trees from them that just grow right away like crazy and it's very impressive. Um, this is a list and this will go on YouTube and you can pause that and I'm not gonna read through all of it, but at the top in the green are the species I like to fill you know, the taller vegetation, less used space, sort of the matrix of plants, things like prairie drop seed and little blue stem in the sun, sprangle sedge in Pennsylvania, sedge in the shade, fox sedge, sun or part shade where maybe it's a little moist. Um, in the red are things that take a lot of foot traffic. Not all of these are incredibly commercially available, but there's James's sedge, another name for that sedge is lawn sedge. Um, I'll show you a picture of it. Golden fruited sedge, if, if the soil is fine textured and moist. Uh, some of the native ragworts. Um, there's a ragwort for pretty much every moisture level and drainage. So um, round leaf ragwort is good for part shade and a broad range of moisture levels. There's also golden ragwort. I don't have that on my list, but I haven't tried it. Oh wait, it is on my list, but I haven't tried it. Um, balsam ragwort and prairie ragwort are good for full sun. Um, and they have low leaves, they bloom, you mow them off, um, and then they're just part of your lawn. Um, the cat's foots or pussy toes, all the species of those are great, but they like good drainage. Um, Robin's plantain is great, and I've already showed some pictures of that, it likes good drainage. Um, uh, light, um, sort of a dappled shade to full sun. Poverty oak grass is a grass I like for good drainage, part shade, especially under oak. It's really good under oak um, and buffalo grass. And some of the other grama grasses in the same genus, so like Cytos grama is more common in Wisconsin. It can actually tolerate some mowing. You can mix that in too. And if, you, if you're away for a month, you'll notice you have Cytos grama blooming in your lawn that you didn't remember was there, um, but it'll persist in that environment. And then in the yellow are all these intermediate things. So wood betony, the prairie smoke, 
there's a, um, you'll I have some nice pictures of grove sandwort, barren strawberry, um, which in southeastern Wisconsin historically was just where there were pine, uh, northern dry forests um, coming down along coastal Lake Michigan and Ozaki and in northeast Milwaukee County. That's where that used to be. I don't think it's there anymore. It's more a northern Wisconsin thing and then an eastern and southern United States thing. Um, uh, some of the bed straws and wild strawberries. And I have some asterisks by things that they're best planted after you've gotten some other things established because otherwise they'll just cover everything up to such an extent it's hard to get other things going. Um, and those are favorites. So this is James's sedge and this is a lawn. This is just, but this is completely passive. This is my parents' old neighborhood in Ames, Iowa. This is under uh, walnut and elm. And I was, I was walking the dog and I was like, hey, wait a minute, that's all James's sedge. This person probably just has to mow it once or twice because it only has two flushes of growth a year. And um, you know, it tolerates the shade, it tolerates the walnut apparently. Um, you know, the sedge doesn't spread by rhizomes. So if you are trying to get it started, you have to, you know, either space the plants really close together and hope the seedlings fill in or space them farther apart and hope the seedlings fill, fill in. But it likes sort of, it's a rich loamy soil um, in this neck of the woods. Um, Sprangle sedge um, is, is a little bit taller. Um, so it's not really in, in lawn areas and so, um, Sprangle sedge is the taller sedge in these pictures. There are a whole bunch of other sedges because I'm sort of a sedge collector, but Sprangle sedge is a really good one. Um, Pennsylvania sedge. I really love Pennsylvania sedge in early to mid-April when it all blooms. It's really pretty and, and bees use it even when there are other spring ephemeral wildflowers blooming around it. So, I mean, it's pollen has some value to them, um, apparently, since they choose it. Um, that's my son, Carl. He's got a little Virgin, um, Virginia Tanuka moth caterpillar that was in the Sprengel sedge. Um, its, host, its host is, you know, native sedges. Seems to like um, Sprengel sedge the most among all the sedges we have, though. And it's a pretty nondescript moth, but you see these. They're, they're black and um, likes the lance leaf coreopsis. Um, prairie drop seed and little blue stem in the sun. Um, Cross a wide range of drainage and in healthy remnant prairies, the native grasses usually aren't, I mean, the dominant grasses usually aren't big blues, the big ones, big blue stem Indian grass and switchgrass that you think of. It's usually lower things like prairie drop seed and even little blue stem. And even in some of our wet prairies and fence, there's little blue stem, um, things like porcupine grass too, but um, that's, that's less available com commercially. Um, I'm gonna show a little bit of a sequence. So this is um, pedunculate sedge, um, just another one of the sedges, but I'm just gonna try to show how things are layered through the season. So I'm starting in March and there's not much, um, but in late March, things sort of start and they're gonna go all the way into December. Um, you know, so we have pask flowers, um, leatherwood, oh, it's a shrub. Um, but I have bumblebees on that when it starts blooming. But then, you know, things like bloodroot, and this picture is just to sort of show its, sort of show its context. There's a bunch of other stuff it's growing with that's going to overtop it soon. There are native sedges here. There are native asters that are going to grow much taller. There are some stems of Joe pie weed that you can see there. It's going to grow much taller later on. Here's the wood betony grown from seed in Pennsylvania sedge. Um, but there's other stuff here. There's yellow pimpernel, there's nodding onion, there's showy, showy goldenrod and all that stuff's gonna grow tall and overtop it. Um, uh, uh, ruin enemy and one of my favorite space filling plants for sort of um, bright shade gross sandwort is this little stuff that's growing all around it. And, you know, there's other stuff in here, wild geranium and there's a little blue-eyed grass that volunteered there. All kinds of neat stuff volunteers when you garden this way, because you have low vegetation and all the low neat things that maybe are expensive to buy initially, they self-sow into the places that they like. Um, and so things are dynamic that way. Um, 
I'm getting a little later just to look at the yard and this view is going to change through the season. Um, the, in the foreground, there's a bunch of um, cat's foot blooming, um, ragwort hasn't started blooming yet. There's sedges eventually in the foreground. I, I'll, I'll mow that off when all that's done and gone to seed. They'll get mowed once or twice. Um, other early stuff like sand flocks. I have a sandy loam soil, um, so I'm lucky I can grow sand flocks. Um, prairie smoke. Here's the growth sandwort a little later. And just all this other stuff mixed in with it, like Robin's plantain. You could spend a lot of time picking out all the plants here. There's white bear lake sedge, which is a nice woodland sedge, and golden alexanders, and big leaved aster, and bellflower. This is under a birch tree, the birch tree in the front yard. Sand flocks, and just uh, your common wood violets that you know were volunteers um, under that birch tree in the front yard, just all of that stuff together. But, you know, a lot of the grassy stuff there, it's Pennsylvania sedge, and then the grove sandwort filling space, and then all of these other flowers just sort of studded into that. And then, then the sedges and the grove sandwort fill up all the intervening space, and it's just very easy to take care of at that point. I'm getting a little bit later. There's some woodland flocks. There's some northern bed straw coming in, pine, mountain blue-eyed grass in the front. Um, under an oak tree in the back, um, a whole bunch of Pennsylvania sedge, but uh, a native legume called pale vetchling coming up through it. Some woodland flocks in the back. There are more violets. There's a short saster right in the middle. So this is just going to develop again continuously through the season. Sort of the moderate use area in the side yard, you know, there's robin's plantain there and ragwort blooming there's some woodland flocks and wild geranium that's come in but you know that'll get mowed down once maybe twice during the season later on then taller stuff either side of it a bunch of native sedges growing actively because it's early in the year um the lawn before i've mowed it a bunch of golden a bunch of uh, prairie ragwort mountain blue-eyed grass there's robin's plantain behind it so I'm just down on the ground taking a picture through the flowers. And so I think this is, I like this more than white clover and dandelions and creeping Charlie. Um, and some of these support some specialists. And in, in, I don't know, I like being able to support the native plants in this context too. Um, just sort of a progression. I showed Sprangles sedge here earlier. It's grown taller, but then other things sort of start to overtop it. So the wild geraniums sort of start to finish and other woodland plants are starting to grow taller. Um, here's some wild geranium. You'll see this later. It'll be all forked aster. Um, some uh, wild hyacinths or prairie hyacinths coming up through um, fox sedge. Uh, Virginia fire pink under that birch tree as the grove sandwort starts to finish up. Uh, false dandelions, um, sort of the same vicinity where all that wood betony was in the Pennsylvania sedge. There's Jacob's ladder there. It's just finished. And yellow pimpernel after that. Um, and then you see sort of in the background some taller stuff. There's some Ohio spiderwort and there's um, showy goldenrod that's going to be blooming later on. Some prairie flocks coming up through Sprengel's sedge. A backyard a little later when it's sort of high spider wart time. Um, but before all the asters and goldenrods really start going, the side yard. So, you know, there's a bunch of um, little blue stem and prairie drop seed here. There are some sedges. And then again, that's studded with um, false indigos and native asters and milkweed and lupin and golden alexanders and this, this is an area that's really dry. There's some bracted spiderwort already going dormant because it's sort of cut down to the road and there's no topsoil and it's um, down to sort of subsoil sandy glacial till stuff. And those grasses with uh, pale purple coneflowers and prairie larkspur and coreopsis and Ohio spiderwort. Um, down along the road, there's a little bit of a ditch, and um, it's a little bit more moist, so it supports some different things. Um, but again, it's getting later. Things are getting taller. I think I showed you an uh, early picture um, of the front yard, you know, after it had been killed, and then a year later, um, 
and there was a bunch of Canada anemone down in this moist area. Well, that all gets overtopped by things like rosin, weed, and prairie dock, and compass plant, and turtle head, and mountain mint, and a flat topped aster. Um, under oak, sort of mid season. Um, in July, Great St. John's wort, the Joe Pye weed is starting to come on. We start to get um, nodding onions, um, uh, you know, cardinal flower, the meadow blazing star by middle to late summer starts blooming. And this was wild geranium before and it's forked aster now in early August, the Joe Pye weeds really going in the background. That's where that early on I was showing um, um, the blood root, and then you know there's Joe Pye weed there now. Um, around the same time in that area, there's you know Starry Campion, early goldenrod. The um, that great St. John's wort is finished now. It's just in the back of this picture. You can see him back there, um, down by the road. The meadow blazing star, compass plants done, little blue stems starting to come into flower. You can make out some monarch butterflies there if you look close. Um, among the meadow blazing stars, because of course that's their favorite. Um, and then asters is sort of, there's a crescendo of asters at the end of the year. And I have all sorts of, I like asters and sort of collect them too. Woodland asters and prairie asters and all of them together here, um, sort of in the part shade under the oaks um, and the grasses. Um, so little blue stem getting in late summer. Um, sky blue aster is sort of the last locally native aster to bloom. Um, aromatic aster is more prevalent in, in uh, western parts of the state. It blooms a little later. Um, but I stretch, um, you know, I'll just briefly allude to this, but um, this is, I grow plant, I have most of my 85% of what's in my landscape is native to Wisconsin. 100% uh, of it's native to Eastern North America. It's all stuff that has shared coevolutionary relationships and prairies and savannas and, and woodlands. Um, this isn't locally native. This is a slightly more Southern aster called prairie aster, Symphia trichum turbinellum, native from central Illinois South. And I grow it, it extends the aster flowering season into the end of October, early November. And bumblebees are still using it then. Um, so maybe that's not the worst thing. Um, and then sort of the last thing, you know, is, is this winter hazel comes on in, in November and goes into early December. And so that's sort of the whole sequence um, of flowering. Um, so how much work is it? Um, that's always a question. Something I think you need to remember is that even Prior to the arrival of Europeans, the savannas and prairies and oak woodlands that existed, they existed, you know, sort of at a large scale, but they, they existed as, as expansive communities only because of how the land was intensively used and, and stewarded by American Indian people. Um, and they would not have had existed otherwise. It had to do with their use of fire. It had to do with their use of agriculture, meaning actually cultivating land and, and rotation and on a rotation abandoning it and that sort of thing. And um, so there's maintenance involved if you wanna support this sort of diversity in this part of the world. And so um, I like this quote because, and, and I can't see it now because, <laughs> so I don't even remember, um, but it's another flaw in the human character is that everybody wants to build and nobody wants to do maintenance. So you plant everything and then things go south in a hurry. Um, and so it's important to go into it with the mindset that you're going to need to do some maintenance. But fortunately here, most of the maintenance is, is at the front end. Okay, so, um, ah, sorry. I, I did something and made my slide stop advancing. There we go. Um, so you're gonna do maintenance. And so you're gonna need some tools. And these are just a couple of tools I really like because they make life a lot easier. There's this wire weeder that Johnny Selected Seed makes and sells out of a lot. And it's this little metal triangle with kind of semi-sharp kind of blunt edges. And when you plant all those transplants out and space them, if you wanna keep it weeded around them, it's just really easy to scrape all of that area around those plants every 
couple of weeks until they fill in with that wire weeder. And if you bump into them, it's kind of blunt. So it usually doesn't cut off the plants you like. Um, you have to really hit them hard to cut them off. So um, it's sort of um, idiot friendly. Um, and, the, and the flame weeder. I use the flame weeder um, if I have killed weeds, maybe I've killed some lawn and I have some annual weeds coming up afterwards. You, you, you can burn that dead grass off or when it's moist and dewy in the morning, you just go over it with the flame weeder and melt them away. Um, so I use the flame weeder a lot. I also use it to maintain property lines and you'll see some examples of that here in a second. So how much work is this really? Well, when it gets to this point, it's really, it's not much. I walk around and enjoy the garden. Every once in a while I see a weed and I pull it. And I have, there's a lot of complexity there, tons of stuff. There's 525 or more species there and I can recognize them. Um, so I recognize the weeds um, and that's a consideration, but and just keep it, keep familiar with every corner um, of a property and you know pull the weeds out when you see it. They're, they don't come in very often when you've got things filled in like this. Um, they're a rare occurrence. You have to miss them for a long time. I don't use mulch. The plants are my mulch. My kids are excited when mulch comes, uh, but I don't use it in the garden. I use it for paths and I use it to de help define the property line. So I have rows of shrubs along the property line and there's mulch along it. And I go along the edge with the flame weeder every few weeks and and burn it down to keep stuff coming in. I do it on a dewy morning so the mulch doesn't smolder during the day. Um, so that's how I use mulch. I use fire. I live in the town and I can. Um, oak leaf litter and prairie vegetation um, is kind of meant to burn. I don't burn everything. I don't burn within 15 feet of the house. I don't burn, I protect areas around shrubs and trees. Um, so there winds up being a pretty good area that doesn't get burned in any given year, but I burn a lot and it discourages certain weeds I don't want. It volatilizes nitrogen out of the system and excess nitrogen is actually a problem. Um, you don't want to um, have a lot of nutrient availability because that promotes weeds. A lot of the plants you're trying to grow, if they're prairie, woodland or savanna plants are efficient and they acquire those nutrients and hold on to them. Um, and if there, um, if there's a lot of litter, and especially if you know oak leaf litter decomposes slowly, releases nutrients slowly, so it's not terrible. But you know other fast decomposing litter, like from walnut, um, mulberry, and box elder, that decomposes quickly, it's releasing that nu those nutrients quickly. And that's why a lot of times you see garlic mustard really doing well under those things because it's just getting fertilized. And um, so this is volatilizing nutrients. Um, along the edge of our property, there was a bunch of garlic mustard under the oak when we moved in, a bunch of buckthorn, I cleared it out. And it's also a way I burn during the dormant season. It keeps garlic mustard from being a problem. Um, we collect seeds and spread them around and the kids can do that. Um, I promote trees where I want them. And I have a lot of acorn caching that goes on along the mulched property lines and where there's low vegetation, which is in a lot of places. I pick the oak trees I want to keep and I protect them. I spray them every three weeks with a deer repe repellent called Bobex and they don't pay me anything. Um, so, I mean, sincerely, it, it works really well for me in Waukesha County Bobex. Um, I spray them in the winter too, every three weeks. And I haven't had anything get browsed on that's been sprayed at least every three weeks, no matter how much it rains. That's a job I do. So that's a winter job. I did it two days ago. I went around and um, sprayed the dormant buds at the ends of twigs um, with that so they wouldn't get um, bitten off. Um, here I'm weeding clover out of my lawn and watching my kids. Um, that's how a lot of the maintenance goes. So I'm sitting here, I look up, I'm like, oh, they're playing, I'll take a picture. But you know, when I'm out and I see a weed in the lawn, I pull it and that's the maintenance. Um, so most of it was really at the front end. Um, and with that, you know, I'm done on my last slide here. I just, these are a couple of recommended readings that are just for sort of regional ecological perspective. There are a lot of good historical accounts in both of these books. Um, and I just, the, a lot of it was outside of my, ecological and biological training. Um, and so I think it's, um, you know, there are mi missing perspectives there. So I would recommend these books. Well, Dan, thank you so much for that presentation.
Um, I don't know about everyone else. My brain is just spinning with plant native plants that I have never heard of nor seen. And um, it's just amazing. I truly <laughs> inspiring. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Um, we have a couple of questions and I know I put a couple into the chat box. So um, I'm gonna just take a look at those. And if anyone wants to unmute to ask a question or maybe turn on your video so we can all see each other before we break for the night, uh, that would be awesome. Um, I, have, I have a couple of questions. Um, on your property, what is the timeline? How long have you been working on that? Um, we moved in in April of 2014. And I had everything covered up with native stuff um, and to the, every, everything pretty much planted in, by 2018. So I, I, I pretty much consistently worked through things for four years to get it all done. And, you know, I still move things around and that sort of thing, but things were in place after about four years. Oh, cool. Um, I also was kind of ask about, do you, you were saying that, um, is this, I know we have a re, we, we're recording this, but did you like some of those charts of plants? Are you making that, of where did you say that was available or? Oh, well, the, that table, yeah. people will just have to pause the YouTube video. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can, um. Yeah, you know, snip your screen. You can okay. pause it. <laughs> okay, do a, Take a screenshot, screenshot of it or something. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. I took pictures, Carolyn. <laughs> yeah. Everyone, because yeah, I really want to look into some of those plants. That's that's amazing. I, I love the concept of using uh, native plants, plant material as mulch versus putting in wood chips or you know rocks or whatever. So that is very interesting. Carolyn, did you have another question? Uh, no, go ahead if you have one. Well, I'm just looking, Judy Newman asked, can you explain, and this was early on in the, the uh, presentation, seed orchards. You talked about volunteers gathering seeds. Um, yeah, maybe a little more info on that. Well, that's just sort of a concentrated place that might be close to home where you focus on growing native species especially those that maybe don't produce a lot of seed or are more effort to collect um, so that you can collect worthwhile amounts for eco ecological restoration projects. So like I have a lot of wood betony in my yard and I, it could be a, if somebody was near me was working on an oak woodland, I could, you know, I could just walk out and gather it when it was fresh. But if I had to go out and gather it from sparse populations scattered here and there and know when it was blooming and when the seed was ripe but hadn't all fallen out of the capsules, that would be difficult. Um, it's also good for stuff like, uh, well, a lot, of, a lot of the plants that are now scarce. Um, it's just a good way to get a lot of seed. And you can grow them in a seed orchard like, like, you know, like, like in a production plot like your garden, like a vegetable garden, or you can eat, eat, grow them in a more natural way, like in a landscape like this. Um, but, you know, a lot of those species, I mean, they're scarcely available commercially, but you look at the highest quality sort of old growth remnant prairies and savannas, and they're like the co-dominant things. We just have very little of that left. Makes me sad, but I'm glad there are people like you and organizations like Prairie Enthusiasts and Wild Ones to create awareness and the importance of these plants. I mean, Doug Tallamy said, you know, it's not an option. We gotta get these plants back into the landscape. We had one question about changing plant zones. Um, and I, I just saw somebody, oh, I saw someone that was talking about um, the changing of, you know, climate change that there is due to temperatures versus amount of light that some of these, you know, plant zones are changing. I wondered if you had a comment on that. 
Well, I think one of the most important things, a lot of these species have very broad ranges. Um, we have very few endemic species. Uh, a lot of these species rate, if you look at their distribution maps, they're, you know, northern U.S. to the Gulf Coast, the plains to the East Coast, because that's where there historically were, there were savannas, woodlands, and prairies. Um, there are historical accounts of a hundred mile long grassland in the Shenandoah Valley in the 1600s, you know, so um, these systems are, are pretty, if, if, but they were there because American Indian people were, were burning the landscape a lot. And so in that context, they're resist, they can exist across these huge gradients. And so I think the important things are they're in a, when it comes to remnant natural communities, their stewardship and burning is a big part of that, um, but also genetic diversity and trying to have as much genetic diversity as possible. And that might mean not strictly local diversity and especially if that might be limiting. And in my own gardening, I mean, I have, like I showed you the prairie aster that's native up to central Illinois. So that's a species that's not even technically native here. But where I live, our present climate temperature and precipitation is about what Peoria was in the middle 1800s. Um, I have a couple Northern pecan trees. They're my fastest growing young trees. Um, you know, there were, you, if you, if you were looking around, like there's some pawpaw trees in our yard and some sassafras and, 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 and American persimmon too. I'm not, I think about, you know, especially in my home landscape, what are, shared co-evolutionary histories and, and just broader North American floras. Hmm. Nice. Um, I just making a personal plug. Um, Johnson's Nursery has always been very good to us. I don't know if you've been out there. They do a really great support for wild ones locally and they they have more of the shrubs and they don't have as many of the, you know, giant plats of, of little, um, you know, two inch band pots just because economically they can't mm -hmm. do as well as agricole, but they've always done, they've always been very generous to us. Um, so I put a plug in for them. If you want to throw them on your slide <laughs> for stuff. I will, I will second that because they truly are just pioneers, you know, when it comes to landscape companies that really support native plants and, and support us, as Carolyn said, it's, yeah, they've been uh, fantastic, lots of good projects and they become more involved with schools and donating tree plants, trees and things like that. So yeah, good job, Johnson's. So let's see, looking at more, a lot of good comments. A true, you Lisa, know, fantastic presentation. Lisa, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. 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 I, I threw in a question. Um, as I looked at this uh, question for Dan, uh, I, I live in Oconomowoc, which is north of you. It sounds like your property is the pretty sandy area of Delsman. Am I correct? Yeah, I, have a, I have a sandy loam soil. Okay, Dan, I, I have the opposite bugger. I, I have that nice, thick, heavy clay soil. And <laughs> many of the things that you talk about easily being able to move around and propagate would not be so successful in my property. Some, some guidance that you would give to um, tackle the clay soil in contrast to the sandy soil. Well, um, one of the things to do is, um, oh, I'm trying to think of good woodland examples around here with soils like that. You know, the problem is where there are clay soils, a lot of times, if it's a nice remnant, you still see a lot of these plants because if it hasn't been disturbed very much, there's topsoil development. So that really nice oak woodland that got the boat launch in it, the soil there is a very, it's a very, it's a very fine sandy loam. It's not sandy loam. It's, it would be classified as a fine textured soil. Um, and it's over glacial, you know, dolomitic glacial till. So it's calcareous in theory, but it has really good topsoil formation because it wasn't 
degraded by overgrazing in the past. It was it's on this island, so it probably never had any cattle grazing on it. And so, you know, the topsoil is in good shape, and you know, organic matter provides the drainage and the sort of the buffering to soil pH. And it's very difficult when you get into more disturbed, heavy soils um, in areas that are open or on slopes, some of those things still do well. Things like the, the field cat's foot and the and prairie ragwort and those sorts of things like in a lawn setting. Um, and a lot of woodland plants, the sprinkles fedge would probably still do well um, in that setting. Um, Pennsylvania sedge will grow in that setting. It just won't spread very quickly. Yes. Rhizomatous things will just spread very slowly. Yes. Um, if there were more organic matter in the soil, um, they might spread a little bit more quickly. Over time, if it's a setting where there's leaf litter deposition, and you, like me, you're not, if you're, if you're unlike, if, unlike me, if you're not burning it off, if, you know, you let some leaf mold and stuff develop, you might, you know, that's a long-term thing. Um, but sort of soil development and humus development um, is really sort of the long-term thing there. And you could think about soil amendments. I just, I hate to do it. I like to just like, well, I have an area in my front yard where they dug the well. Um, they redug the well when we moved in and they just spread out all the deep down fine. There's, there's some clay in that. And I just went over it and um, what does well there is what's growing there. I didn't amend it at all. Um, it takes some experimentation, I would say, but um, ah, we don't have out here, Clay, Oconomowoc. Um, well, there just aren't like, many good places to go look at like a woodland. Correct. Uh, yeah. Correct. Menominee Falls area, Lisbon area, there's clay and it's woodland. Menominee Park is got an amazing woodland area. Yeah. yeah, if you start to get into more as you go to the east, but yeah, the primary difference between that and maybe an area that's more residential might just be the level of soil disturbance. Um, um, Nature Centers has a ton of clay. Yeah, pretty much everything Menominee falls down to Franklin and Eastern Racine and Kenosha County East, except for Chewaukee Prairie. Is heavy soil, um, and you know there are what there's um, oh gosh, there are the woods. That, I mean, there are lots of places. Petrifying Springs woods. There are there are woods in Milwaukee County and Ozaukee County for sure too, and that are pretty nice. And there's some little fragments around Menominee Falls, in Northern Waukesha County too, um, like you mentioned. So. I have, with I have one other flower walks in the spring and look around. Yeah. yeah. I have Maybe one I other question. Um, I'd like you to give a little plug for the prairie enthusiasts. I know this past weekend, my husband Rick here um, went to uh, Scuppernong and helped on their volunteer day. So um, you and other people, I can put this link in. There's a DNR webpage for volunteers that want to do things for different areas, which um, the, the prairie enthusiasts have their things listed. There's something to do in the you know southeast Wisconsin like every weekend um, to volunteer. So I just wanted you to plug it a little bit. I would do that happily. And I, well, and I go to a lot of those, but I just not last weekends. Um, so the Prairie Enthusiast has chapters. So there's a Glacial Prairie chapter in southeastern Wisconsin, most focused in Jefferson and Waukesha counties. We actually have a management agreement with the University of Milwaukee Field Station to manage their Benedict Prairie because they lost really, over time, they've lost the capacity to manage that site. So just a year and a half ago, we started doing that um, um, and you know so we've been doing brushwork and, and, and burning at that site so um, that's a site that we actually are in charge of the management of but we volunteer with the state natural areas a lot in southeastern Wisconsin um, and then there are other chapters that have more preserves like the Empire Chalk Sock chapter in 
and the Southwest chapter and the Prairie Bluff chapter, which are in South Central and Southwest Wisconsin, have some really good preserves and projects. Um, Empire Sock chapter has a Mounds View grassland project that is several hundred acres. It has remnant prairies, but they're restoring grasslands to connect it all. Um, that Black Earth Redmond Prairie is a prairie enthusiast preserve. The best place to go see savanna and oak woodland that's well managed in southern Wisconsin is um, the Pleasant Valley Conservancy. Um, the prairie enthusiast owns a portion of that and has an easement on the rest of it. Um, the prairie enthusiast only acquires properties or takes easements if it has the capacity for their stewardship. It doesn't protect places you know, to build a, a land portfolio of acres, the volunteer capacity has to be there to manage them. We have burn insurance, um, you know, some stuff gets contracted, volunteers do most of it. Um, and, you know, my position with them is kind of new because there are a lot of people that volunteer, um, but they're also, and there are preserve and TPE protects, prioritizes protecting remnant natural communities of the highest quality. Um, because we don't even have enough capacity to, I mean, there are still more opportunities to do that than we have capacity. So that's where the, the priority is. But uh, my position is to work with private landowners because there are still opportunities with private landowners too. Um, and a lot of our members are working on their properties. Um, there are chapters like the, the Prairie, Prairie Sands chapter in the Central Sands that's mostly landowners. A lot of them have just these amazing properties. And there is just sort of a community of people that are all doing things on their properties and you know, sharing seeds and, and helping each other you know, burn stuff and that sort of thing. Um, we have a conference in a, next month. It's all virtual. It's focused on, uh, well, Doug, tell me he's speaking at our conference too, but a lot of the presentations are centered around oak savannas and woodlands. The science portion is, and uh, the presentation I'm giving is on oak, savanna, and woodland restoration and management. Um, so that's a focus there. Um, and uh, there's a burn school as a part of that. Like it's, you know, there's a few days of programming and then it, you know, it's all streaming. You can play at any time. So um, that conference is coming. Would this, these events be listed on a uh, webpage? What is the website for Prairie Enthusiasts? Oh, if you Google the Prairie Enthusiast, you'll find the website and it's on there. On, I posted on the, it in the chat. Yeah. And oh, awesome. I'm navigating there now. If you go under events, um, 2022 TPE virtual conference is there um, with sort of the, with the schedule. Um, oh, they got my picture up there. Got everybody's <laughs> picture up there. Um, huh. Okay. Now I'm, I'm learning who all is talking in the conference, so I'm interested. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I, I had one other question. Um, I have a property that had a lot of invasives. Um, and when I started to remove invasives, a lot of native plants popped up. I mean, I have not planted one bloodroot and they have been just increasing all through the yard and various plants that I have not planted are showing up. I mean, could that be the sign that the area is or had been, maybe could be a remnant woodland, wetland, when you see well, things just volunteer without planting? It's difficult to say. I can tell you that in even, so I see a lot of very, so bloodroot occurs in, in, in forest systems like you know maple basswood forests but also yeah. in oak woodlands and savannas um it often persists longer in woodlands and savannas when they get more closed in because it's more shade tolerant mm -hmm. um but species like that when invasives get really bad a lot of times they just get kind of smaller and smaller and smaller until they're just you know they're each year they're a little smaller and they're i found like sometimes i've seen um um, kitten tails that are just like the size of a, their leaves are like my pinky fingernail and eventually they just go away. And when they're like that, they're pretty invisible. Um, and then you clear things out, um, those mites, that's what's responsible for things coming back more often than a seed bank for most species. Um, something like bloodroot, I mean, its seeds are moved around by ants. So it's either 
was there or its seeds are getting moved within what its dispersal distance would be from ants from somewhere nearby. I think um, that's part of it, but boy, the bloodroot leaves in, in my yard, they are bigger than my hand. I mean, yeah. They're becoming a really cool early ground cover almost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then along with other asters I've never planted and, you know, the property was um, elm trees and uh, ash, which I have, if anyone needs ash wood, I've got lots of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's a it, there's a large area around my yard that has um, some really interesting, you know, beautiful, non-invasive uh, woodlands and wetlands. So just wondering, I'm kind of trying to work with our town to preserve those lands um, from mm -hmm. development and rezoning. So I just well, any, anyone else? Lisa, I've noticed the same thing with the nature center where we removed uh, buckthorn and the garlic mustard. All of a sudden, we have the blood root, uh, spring beauties, and all kinds of things popping up. Yep. Sedges, yep. sedges, uh, jack in the pulpits, all of these plants yep. that were not there, just observing these things. And this is where it was basically the um, field rod and gun club. And we've got lots of other things going, but getting rid of the James Rocket and the garlic mustard. And all of a sudden we have all these beautiful things popping up. Well, I can tell you that, well, Jack in the pulpit specifically seems to be able to move a long ways. <laughs> it shows up in places that were wide open prairie that get closed in with thicket and it'll be in the thicket and they got there <laughs> by animals somehow, apparently. Um, but yeah, a lot of those other ephemerals, if they're moving in, they're moving in by ants. I can say just anecdotally, you know, I, I'm out in the driftless area a lot. And, you know, there's these steep ridges with south facing slopes and north facing slopes and the prairies and oak woodlands and savannas were on south facing slopes and ridge tops. And a lot of times the north slopes were oak woodlands or oak forest and maybe bits of, you know, more closed forests that had spring ephemerals in them. And now, you know, with the exclusion of fire from the landscape as it's closing in on those south facing slopes, you know, it can be several hundred yards. It can be an eighth of a mile maybe. And if there's connectivity with over the ridge top or around the nose of the slope, those spring, I've seen spring ephemeral, like spring ephemerals and other woodland plants. So things like white bear lake sedge and pedunculate sedge and spring beauty and sharp lobe tapatica coming into areas where you still see the prairie plants like hoary pacoon and prairie flocks and little blue stem fading out. Um, so they can move some, but there's connectivity there. Um, so them coming back into to an area to me suggests either connectivity with a source population or they were just you know they were down in that little sort of micro leaf barely hanging on about to blink out stage and you saved them <laughs> all right well at least it, it's kind of an optimistic look at how quickly lands regenerate mm -hmm. once we get back to natives you know get rid of the other stuff and i think that uh that's what we have to keep obviously striving for is to plant native plants or let native plants grow or create a habitat where they can grow. So before we wrap up, I think uh, Rick and Nancy had a question or a statement. I, I just had a comment. Um, uh -huh. I can't help but think after all listening to everybody, um, and most of you know this, but we live in a condo, Rick and I, but we managed the four acres of prairie on our church property. Our church burned and you know, how many years ago? Oh, oh, oh. Oh, four. And when, so we had an opportunity to start from scratch and they decided, and I'm so happy they did that on the 10 acres of our property, four acres are prairie. Um, if we had to do it over again, I wish we would have known what we know now because <laughs> they planted a lot of tall grass and prairie plants, but, um, and I miss the short grass prairie plants, but um, they have done, what we've noticed in the last number of years is the root systems on these plants have done such a wonderful job on the soil that 
It used to just be hard as a rock. And now we can dig stuff, we can plant things, we can, you know, the soil is just so much looser and wonderful. And just to, to watch that happen and be a part of it has been really wonderful. So we love, we love native plants and we get our fill over at church. And do and you want to just tell everyone where your church is? Because it is truly a, a beautiful property. Yeah, I wish We're it was on, on a, a busier street yeah. so more people <laughs> could see it because when it's blooming in July, it's just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, it's on uh, Town Line Road, just south of Lisbon. Mm -hmm. It's in the town of Lisbon, actually, and uh, anybody's welcome to come there. This isn't a good time to see it, but no. you know, in, in uh, <laughs> mid-July, oh. mid, you know, July and into early August. And we have walking paths that go yeah. through, and we're, you know, we're just in, everybody is welcome. Anytime you want to come and just feel good, that's the place to go. <laughs> it is a very special place, for sure, and thank you both for being most, stewards. The other thing we've noticed, it's about, I think, coming into its 17th season, and the maintenance has really oh, dropped off. It used to yeah. be we had a lot of invasives that we'd have to go in and uh, get out, and now it's mm -mm. it's relatively easy. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's really nice. wonderful landscape. <laughs> you put in the early work. Yeah, we yeah. did. Yeah, well, we remember that. Us and a bunch of other <laughs> helpers yeah. we had, but wow, it was hard at the beginning. Well, we are at a little after 8, 8, 12. Um, anyone else question or comment before we wrap things up for the night? And yay, our first program is. Yes. Been, Thank you very much. Yeah, it's good to be back. And Dan, this was excellent. Really, really yeah. inspiring. Yeah. Learned so much. Yes. Hopeful that spring will come. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the only consistent thing these days is the uh, is nature. You know, mm -hmm. today it's cold as heck, but it's January. It feels normal compared yeah. to <laughs> what we've been going through. <laughs> a little more snow and a little more cold would be good for everything. Yeah, yeah. I don't have. I we only have like an inch and a half of crust left yeah. on the ground. I'd like to see a little more than I, that before it gets I, really. I've got about four or five inches at least. <laughs> oh, we don't. <sighs> Yeah. Well, Dan, thank you so very much for spending the evening with us. This was really, I sure my, like I said, my brain is just whirring around with all the new plants to look up and, and to check out. Um, we really appreciate it. And uh, we are going to be posting this on our YouTube page. So if you want to go back, check some of the slides out, that plant list, uh, it'll be there. And we will see you all next month yay and talk okay. about um, native orchids which that's in a whole another oh, amazing yeah. topic yeah yeah yep. thanks everyone bye yeah bye. Thank you, Dan. Dan. Yeah. take care bye. Bye, bye. bye everybody good to see you bye bye bye, -bye.